going to do a little visualization right now. Um, I want everybody to close your eyes. And I'm looking. No cheating. Angus and Bo means you guys. I want you guys to imagine you're standing on a cliff. And beneath the cliff is a pool of water. And you know that it's deep enough. You know that you can jump off it. And, you, and you're, the water's a good temperature. But you're high up. If you're afraid of heights, it's about 10 feet. If you're not afraid of heights, it's about 20, 30 feet. And you're looking down, and you're getting ready to jump off that cliff or that bridge into the water. Can you feel that nervousness in your chest? Can you feel that kind of anxiousness and the adrenaline starting to swell up? OK, now you jump. Ready? Jump. You hit the water. It seemed like it was a split second. It seemed like it was forever. You go in. You come up. You're completely wet. Your teeth are showing because you're smiling from ear to ear. You're safe. You did it. Everything is great. You, you did it. You jumped off the cliff. You have this burst of adrenaline coursing through your body now that you did it. OK, open your eyes. What you felt when you were up on that cliff, you were scared, right? It was a little bit of fear. But you did it. And you jumped. And then you got that, that adrenaline rush, that endorphin rush afterwards, that, that celebration, that, that reward for doing it. That's what I want to talk a little bit about today. Um, themes kind of scare yourself. And based on the, uh, the singing that you guys did earlier, <laughs> I think this is going to be easier. So I want you to, we're going to do a little vote right now, OK? We're going to, three people, I'm going to point out three people. That underline, we're going to fill in the blank, and then everyone's going to use that for the rest of this talk, OK? So uh, scare the blank out of yourself. What's your blank? Scare the blank. What's the blank mean for you? OK? How about right here? OK, how about right there? Scare the change out of yourself. OK? All right. Let's go with that. Uh, let's all vote. What do you want to go with? Number one, shit. Number two, fuck. Number three, change. Come on. I'm hearing one. OK, it's between one. It's between shit and change. Everybody for shit? Uh, everybody for change. Yeah. That's tough. That's tough. We need a tiebreaker here. What do you want to do? Yeah, which one? Number one or number three? No, you. You're what, eight years old? <laughs> which one? Number one or number three? OK, it's number three. Yeah, OK, we're going for three then. All right, so um, throughout this talk, when we hit that scare the beep, we can actually do beep. You want to do beep? We'll do beep. OK, so every time we get to a section that was scary, that I was scared or that this thing was scared, I'm going to throw the flag. OK? And I want everyone in the room to go beep. OK? So we'll practice. Yada, 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 yada. Good. Let's practice one more time. Blah, 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 blah. Perfect. OK. We'll be watching. So what I do for a living, I have this amazing, blessed life. I have had the opportunity to work on James Bond films. I've, I've shot videos, Grammy nominated videos. Um, got to work with Common and Kanye and Alicia Keys and Jack White. Uh, made television shows. I've done all these amazing things that I'm really proud of. But the most amazing thing I've ever done is meet this guy. This guy's name is Tempt. And Tempt in the 80s and 90s was one of the foremost graffiti artists in the LA scene. And he came home from a run one day and said, Dad, my legs are tingling. And that was the onset of ALS. ALS is also Lou Gehrig's disease. It's a nasty, nasty disease that starts, it's kind of like the blob. It starts at your toes and it kind of works its way up. There's a couple different ways it can go, but it usually results, most of the time results in total paralysis. Temp now is completely paralyzed except for the use of his eyes. So we were exposed to him. My wife and I were exposed to him and what he was all about. And my company decided we're going to, at the end of the year, instead of giving gifts to our clients that 
there, look at, and forget about. We decided we're going to give money in the, in the name of the Tempt One Foundation. So we went and we met with um, Temp's brother, Stephen, and his dad, Ron. And we sat down at this little cafe in downtown Los Angeles and said, all right, so we've got this money we want to give you. What are you going to use it for? And before I even got the four out, his brother said, I just want to talk to my brother again. I just, I just want to speak with my brother. And I said, well, wait a second. I've seen the videos. I've seen Stephen Hawking. I've, I've seen those things. You know, there's the machine, right? That, you know, they, they use their eyes and it works and they talk and they type and it talks. That's, we've all seen it. He goes, yeah, I've seen that. Those machines are tens of thousands of dollars. And if you have insurance, you can kind of navigate it sometimes, but we don't have insurance. So we can't get it. I was like, well, then how do you talk to him? He said, well, you take a piece of paper, and on the piece of paper, there's an alphabet. And we run our finger along the, the piece of paper. And every time we get to a letter, he blinks, temp blinks, and we write that letter down. And then we start over. Again, blinks, write the letter down. Letters form words, worms, words form sentences, and that's how the conversation works. You can imagine how painstaking that is. You know, if you mess up, if he blinks accidentally, if you write the wrong word down, it throws the whole thing out. So I said, all right, that's, that's not right. That shouldn't be the case. So I committed right there. I said, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do two things. One, Tempt will communicate again. He will talk. We're going to get him a machine. We're going to get him that Stephen Hawking machine so he can talk. The other thing is Tempt's going to draw again. He needs to draw again. He needs to be able to express himself and do his art. Yeah, I was scared. What the heck am I doing? I have no clue. I'm not an ocular scientist. I've never done anything with ocular recognition. I had no idea how I'm going to do this. But it was one of those things where something deep inside of me said, you just got to do it. This has to happen. It's not right that this, this brilliant artist is not able to communicate and, it's, and express himself through his art. So the first thing we did is I sick my team of producers on navigating the insurance system and the hospital system. And we got him a My Toby machine, which is the Stephen Hawking machine. All right, check one. We got that one out of the way. You can imagine, having not been able to speak for so many years, he gets this machine. He's now on Facebook. He's emailing. He's talking. And he's got a wicked sense of humor, too, a really wicked sense of humor. And he's now able to express himself. So the next part we got that one, so we're, you know, we're, we're, we're psyched, we're happy. Next part is we're still kind of clueless of how we're going to be able to pull this one off. So I got invited to speak at a conference in North Carolina, and I had the opportunity to meet some of the other people that were speaking, and there were these guys called GRL, Graffiti Research Lab. And what they had created was this device or this, this toy, this, this form of, of expression that was, let them project light on the sides of surfaces, and then with a laser pointer right on the side of those surfaces. So they could do, basically, graffiti any place, and it was non-permanent. So I came home from this conference, and I was sitting down uh, to dinner with my wife, and I said, oh, dude, these guys were amazing, and they, and they totally uh, were, were, were really funny, too. While I was giving my speech, do you guys know what Rick Rolling is? I got, they, they churned these speakers in the other room against it and rickrolled me in the middle of my talk, which was pretty funny. Um, but they, they have this thing, and there's lasers, and there's light, and da 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 And she's like, wow, well, wait a second. We already got them on my Toby, so we know that there's the ability to control a computer with your eyes. And if these guys have a laser that allows them to do graffiti on the sides of building, why don't we just, you know, marry the two? Will you uh, pass the salad dressing? And I was like, babe, we... Wait, wait, hang on. Forget the salad dressing. What? And that was it. That was like the spark. That lit the fuse. So the next day, we called the guys, and we said, we got this amazing idea. Here's what we want to do, and this is the situation, and here's this artist, and we mapped it all out for them. Are you guys in? Do you guys want to do this thing? And they were like, nah. And we're like, ah, no, we had it figured out. We got it. No, you got to do this. You got to do this. So Slight tangent, whenever you think you got it figured out, and this is the one way, and this is the one guy, or girl, or boss, or job, or break, or gig that you need to get your break, to get, it's not true. There's never, there's never one path. Um, 
I thought there was, so we convinced him the next day. The next day we said, we're going to do this. We called him back, and we, we, you know, we talked about it. We talked about some of the things, and they, they ended up agreeing to do it, which I'm incredibly happy that they did. So it took about a year's worth of planning. We flew these six programmers and hackers from all over the world. There was only one person that lived in the United States. We flew them to our house. We, my wife and kids and I, we moved out of our house, moved into the back. They all moved in the front on air mattresses and couches and whatnot. And this is kind of a shot you can see shooting down. You can see took over tables. We just, it was like a carb fest, just eating spaghetti and pancakes for two weeks. And we went through and we just started figuring out how this was going to work. So when they landed and I went to go pick them up, I was like, oh, this is a, oh, no, what the, what if this doesn't work? What if we spent all this money to fly all these guys from around the world to our house, and now this thing's not actually going to work? So I'm like, all right, well, it's too late now. They're, they're showing up. They show up to the house. We start programming this, some of the screenshots from the code. My kids got involved. <laughs> My dog got involved. <laughs> and at the end of this two-week program carbohydrate hack fest, we came up with this, which was a device that was made of sunglasses. I live in Venice Beach. Sunglasses from the Venice Beach boardwalk that we knocked the lenses out, took some copper wire, some zip ties or electrical tape, and created an armature that came out from the side, put on some uh, a, uh, IR lights to kind of illuminate the eye, and uh, we hacked open a PS3 webcam and mounted it to it and USB cord into the thing. And uh, this is some prototypes. These are some prototypes. And that's kind of the final, one of the final pieces. And this is the iWriter. The iWriter was born. And we said, all right, all right. We did some testing. We, we took it and we showed it to Temps a couple times. And all right, I, th I think we got it. I think we, I mean, we, we think this is going to work. So we go to Temps hospital room. And I love this picture because on the one side, you have all this hustle and bustle of going on. On the other side, there's nothing going on. It just, it really reflects kind of the energy that was emanating from that room. And as I'm driving over there, I'm thinking, this is amazing. We flew all these people in. We've been programming. We've tested our prototypes. We've got all this stuff going on. <sighs> what if this thing doesn't work? You know, like what happens if we've gone through all of this and this thing doesn't work? Guess what? It didn't work. We showed up. We kicked his bed to the side. He's facing out so we could, uh, we set up a projector outside of the hospital room so it was projecting on a wall. We set up a, a, a computer so that he could, from his hospital bed, draw. It would beam the signal down to the parking lot and then beam it on a wall so he was gonna, he'd do graffiti again for the first time in seven years. And we're like, this is amazing. The wireless card didn't work. So we're scrambling around. We finally got the wireless card, got it to work. We go down there and for the first time, Tempt Drew for the first time in seven years. Yeah, it was awesome. And if you can imagine the, just the, the energy that was going on in the parking lot and in the hospital room where their brother, their son, their friend, everybody was down there, and all of a sudden, everybody was kind of messing around, and they were doing kind of some writing, and all of a sudden, he goes up, and he starts sending up these messages, and he starts writing, and it, people were hugging and high-fiving. It was, it was truly, truly amazing. Um, so after this, he sent us this email, which is an email that has motivated and inspired us all throughout this entire process, which is, that was the first time I had drawn anything for seven years. I feel like I had been held underwater and someone finally reached down and pulled my head up so that I could catch a breath. Which is, if you think about it, it's, imagine having something that you love taken away for seven years and then given back to you in a split second. And that's kind of what happened. So this was the start of the foundation that my wife and I started called the Non-Impossible Foundation. And it's really based on the premise that ordinary people can do extraordinary things. They just need to be teamed up and inspired and so motivated that they have to get accomplished and, and just driven to accomplish it. And um, this is an invitation to participate. Go to nonimpossiblefoundation.org. If you want to contribute, if you have ideas, if you want to support us in any way, shape, or form, we encourage and welcome it. Everything we do, and this is an incredibly important point, 
Everything we do is DIY, you make it yourself, and it's open sourced. We want to, it's you know the saying, teach a man to fish, as opposed to give him a fish? We want to teach people, we want to give people the tools to do it themselves. So by giving them, open, get, publishing the code, letting them have the ability to write the code, do the code, expand the code, make the, make the glasses, that, that we want this thing to continue to populate the world. So this thing blew up on us. Uh, we got invited to speak at conferences, we started winning awards, we got NPR covered us, Wired covered us. Uh, keep in mind, this is trying to help one person. We just wanted to help Tempt, and the thing just blew up. Um, Gizmodo wrote about us as one of the top eight incredible inv health inventions to transform lives. Uh, Lance Armstrong tweeted about us. And Time Magazine honored us as one of the top 50 inventions of 2010, which was pretty awesome. Yeah. And slight tangent story, we were presenting at a, a Yahoo Internet conference, and um, this venture capitalist came up and said, so, what's your business model? And I said, we have the ultimate scalable business model. This makes, this makes eBay, eBay look like a corner you know, bagel shop. This is the ultimate in scalability. And this guy was like, just, he's like, what is it? And I said, it's free. And he was like, oh. Oh, I don't get it, I don't get it, I don't get it. Ah. Jim, Jim, you gotta hear this. I don't know what's going on. These guys are onto something big. So uh, that summer, summer of 2010, we got a call. We were on vacation and we got a call in June inviting us to participate in what was going to be one of the biggest exhibitions on graffiti and street art at the Geffen Contemporary in downtown Los Angeles. And we're just like, ah, this is amazing. He's doing his art. We promised him that not only was he going to communicate again, but that he was also going to do his art. And when he did his art, we said, the next time we do a show, it's not going to be, because that's how we actually met him. We met him at a gallery show where all of his friends and artists put their art on the wall, but none of his art was on the wall. So we said to his, his father and brother, the next time this happens, his art's going to be on the wall. So we're like, this is it. This is it. This is fantastic. So we started making the piece, and we were you know, figuring out how we're going to do this. And of course, Temp's not going to make it. You know, he's not just going to do a drawing. He's, this guy's brilliant. He wants to do something big. He wants to do something revolutionary. So we're talking about a sculpture now, and how do we get a guy who's paralyzed to do a sculpture? And we're kind of navigating this whole world. And we get down to the time to present, you know, or to, to figure out like, where it's going to go in the museum. And we're like, you know, I think we're weeks away at this point, like four or five weeks away. Um, and uh, we go to meet with these guys and to tell them, you know, like, okay, wh where's it going to go and start doing all that kind of stuff. And they say, well, we, we kind of, we changed the size of your space. No, no. Oh, like, uh-oh. Red flag. Big red flag. You changed the size of our space. And they did it once, and then the next week they did it again, and our space was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And we had a 12-foot sculpture, right? No mathematician, but when you take a 12-foot sculpture that was supposed to be in a 15-foot space and you reduce it to eight feet, something's going something's gonna to bend, right? Uh, we got closer to the date, and they said, well, you know, we're just not sure if it's significant enough. You know, we don't, we're not sure if Tempt is not significant. He's a paralyzed artist doing graffiti with his eyes. What do you mean he's not significant enough? <laughs> on the poster that they used to promote the event, his name was written on the poster because the guy who made the poster felt that he was so significant enough that he needed to do a shout-out on this wall for it. What are you talking about not significant enough? And then the last one was great. Yeah, it's a little too arty. <laughs> too... I'm not going to touch that one. Too arty. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> beep, beep, beep. So, I mean, yeah. And we're bummed. I mean, we're really, really, really bummed. We're, we, we did a documentary on this whole thing, and we look back at some of the footage of this thing, and we're just, like, downtrodden. Our heads are down, and we're just really, really, really defeated. We're not sure what we're going to do. So, we put together, we got all, the friends, all of his friends together, and we did, it's called a memorial wall. And uh, I'll show you a little piece about how this thing works. 
Well, it reminds me of a story that he told me about a Chinese, Chinese, uh, Chinese Buddhist monks that would come down from the mountain and uh, and get drunk on wine and paint all over inside the the, the establishment, just tag it all up, but with with these brushes, you know, and uh, almost in a fervor, in a, in, you know, and I and I yeah, I kind of see that in him, <laughs> you know, and see that in us, and so I definitely see that 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 energy. to do it it was it was so much that he we all kind of felt it from him you know and we all wanted to make sure our letters were tight we all wanted to make sure that he could say hey that looks cool you know everyone's tempted to say hey those letters are cool because he's really looking at it and if he, it ain't cool he'll tell you hey uh, that's kind of wag like you know maybe you want to do this you know and that kind of ethic is is unique only to graph throughout the world is that we're I I, I think we're the only ones that are are inclusive we don't mind if you want to learn how to paint you roll with us not so individualistic so we made this wall and we still didn't know what we were going to do we had this huge sculpture it really didn't have a home and one of temp's best friends um Rogelio cabral he goes with the tag of angst uh, was invited to speak or invited to present in a graffiti show and uh, he basically said to him, hey, I would really have this other piece I really think you should take a look at and you should do it. And they said, uh, yeah, you know, we'll consider it. And he called us and he said, it's in. He didn't tell us they said we'd consider it. He just said, all right, it's in, we got it. And he said, because there's no way this is not going in. So this is a look of the piece kind of pre being hung. And that's the piece up on the wall. That's the piece that Temp did with his eyes. And the most amazing thing about this piece, there's lots of amazing things about it. First of all, if you were there, it feels like it's erupting from the wall. I mean, it feels like it's just coming at you, right? Um, people were coming up. They were coming under it and looking under it. They know they were, you're getting perspectives because it was a three-dimensional drawing, a three-dimensional piece of typography that was literally there, and it had the energy to come at you. On the right-hand side over here, there was the, uh, the placard that said the name of the piece and the artist. The best thing about this is not once did it say it was done with his eyes or that this guy is paralyzed or blah, blah, blah. It's here's the piece, here's the artist, bam. And that's all it was about. And the piece, I mean, of course I'm biased. I thought it was the best piece in the show. But it was a piece because it, it was an amazing piece because it was an amazing piece and that was it. So kind of the whole point of this story was we were scared the entire time, from the very first pancake meeting where I committed to doing this stuff, to talking to the guys of asking them to try to help us out, to um, figuring out if we could get them to come out. Once they came out, was it gonna work? Once, it, once we got it to work and we got there and it didn't work, is it gonna work? It was, just, it was just failure after failure. It was being scared the entire time. I would say that if you really think about it, anything, this concept of what's impossible is a fallacy. Every single thing in this room, every single thing in our life was impossible at one time. If you really, like, take a hit on the hookah and think about that, right? <laughs> Everything was impossible at one point. This room, the shoes, computers, flight, walking, standing upright, everything was impossible at one point. I would challenge and encourage everybody to, to, if you see something that you feel, you get that tinge in your stomach, that needs to change, or I need to do something about that. Don't ignore it, especially if it scares you. Because it, maybe it's not possible right now, but just because it's not possible right now doesn't mean it's gonna be impossible forever. And there is a mantra that I live by, which is, 
If not now, then when? And if not me, then who? And for this TEDx event, I'd like to pose some other mantras, which is, if you're scared, then you're exactly where you need to be. You're in exactly the right place. When you get that tinge in your stomach and you're a little nervous, should I pick up the phone? Should I go talk to that guy or girl in the bar? Should I make that, you know, should I, should I try, should I jump off that cliff? Remember that feeling when you're jumping off the cliff and you, you did it and you came up and you're like, this is great. Be scared. Scare yourself every single day. Scare the out of yourself every single day. Thank you guys very much.